In the early 1990s, the Royal Australian Navy found itself at a crossroads. Its three Perth-class guided missile destroyers were aging rapidly. Their weapons, sensors, and combat systems were becoming obsolete. And it was clear, replacements were needed. The Navy's Adelaide-class frigates were newer, yes, but they lacked the capability to provide wide-area air defense, a critical role that only true destroyers could fulfill. At one point, Australia considered expanding its fleet of Anzac-class frigates, adding six more ships to take on the air defense role. But there was a problem. The Anzacs were simply too small to meet that mission effectively. So, by the year 2000, Australia launched an ambitious project to develop and acquire a dedicated class of air warfare destroyers, a project that would eventually give birth to the Hobart class. The primary mission of these new destroyers to escort naval task forces and defend high-value assets like amphibious assault ships from airborne threats including anti-ship missiles and hostile aircraft. But the vision didn't stop there. These ships would also pack robust capabilities for anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface operations, and support for amphibious landings, making them versatile combatants in the fleet. At the heart of this new destroyer would be one of the most advanced combat systems in the world, Aegis. Developed by Lockheed Martin for the U.S. Navy, the EGS system was and still is a gold standard in naval warfare. While the EGS system was non-negotiable, the ship that would carry it didn't have to be American. Several international shipbuilders submitted their proposals. Two designs emerged as frontrunners, the evolved Arleigh Burke Flight 2 from the United States, and the Alvaro de Bazan class frigate from Spain's Navantia. The evolved Burke was initially favored. It offered more firepower, greater range, and a larger hull with a massive 90-cell vertical launch system. But it was also expensive and existed only as a concept, not a proven ship. On the other hand, the Spanish design was already operational, cheaper and could be delivered four years earlier. Add to that the fact that Navantia was already working with Australia on the Canberra-class LHDs, and the choice became clear. In October 2007, the Australian government signed an $8 billion Australian dollar contract with Navantia to build three Hobart-class destroyers, with an option for a fourth that was ultimately declined. Construction was led by the Australian Submarine Corporation, known for building the Collins-class submarines. Ship modules were produced by Forgatch Marine and Defense and BAE Systems Australia. The three ships were named HMAS Hobart, HMAS Brisbane, HMAS Sydney. But the building process was anything but smooth. From incorrect keel blocks and rejected modules to faulty piping and delays, the program faced multiple setbacks. A block built by BAE was found to be incompatible with neighboring sections, blamed on flawed drawings from Navantia. Later investigations backed that claim. Commissioning timelines were pushed further and further. Originally intended to be completed by 2016, the last ship wasn't delivered until 2020, four years late. Costs rose slightly, finishing at 9.1 billion Australian dollars. Despite the rocky start, the Hobart-class destroyers are now fully operational and impressive. Each ship displaces 7,000 tons, is 147 meters long, and boasts a combined diesel or gas propulsion system, allowing speeds over 28 knots and an operational range of over 9,300 kilometers. That's a lot of ocean, perfect for Australia's vast maritime environment. Armed with a 48-cell Mark 41 VLS, the Hobarts can launch. SM-2 missiles for medium-range air defense. Evolved Sea Sparrow missiles, quad-packed for dense salvos. And soon, Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles with a range of 1,500 kilometers. For surface targets, the older Harpoon missiles are being phased out in favor of the Naval Strike Missile. A stealthy modern weapon with enhanced range and survivability. And if an incoming missile slips through, the Hobarts have a Phalanx C-IWS at the rear, Bushmaster autocannons at the front, 
and the Nolka Active Decoy System, a uniquely Australian innovation to fool sea skimming threats. Central to the Hobart's combat power is the Aegis Baseline 7.1 system. Driven by the AN-SPY-1DV radar, offering continuous, 360-degree coverage of the battle space. Supplementing it is the AN-SPQ-9B radar for horizon scanning, vital for detecting low-flying sea-skimming threats. The Mark 99 fire control system directs missiles with pinpoint precision, while cooperative engagement capability allows these ships to share targeting data with other assets, turning the Hobarts into powerful nodes in a broader networked defense grid. Anti-submarine warfare? They've got that covered too. Each ship is equipped with a hull-mounted sonar and towed array sonar, passive torpedo detection and decoy systems, and a powerful MH-60R Seahawk helicopter capable of hunting submarines, deploying sauna boys, and delivering torpedoes. If needed, two Mark 32 Mod 9 launchers on board can fire lightweight torpedoes in close quarters defense. The Hobart-class destroyers are not the largest warships afloat. They're not the most heavily armed either, but for Australia's unique strategic needs, they're a near-perfect fit. And with upgrades planned to the newer Aegis Baseline 9 or 10, these ships are set to remain frontline guardians of the Royal Australian Navy well into the future. After a troubled birth, the Hobart class has emerged as a symbol of resilience, capability, and forward-thinking naval power. If you enjoyed this breakdown of Australia's premier warship, give this video a like and subscribe for more deep dives into modern military tech. Which ship should we cover next? Let us know in the comments.